Yeah, uh, the Vishnu Priya, initially uh, I will be a little yes. intimidating. It will take okay. you a couple of days to get used to me. Huh? So, okay, sir. Yeah, uh, these people are still not used to me. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that's why I'm doing this uh, particular session today. Uh, yeah, so what I'm basically talking is talk, talking about is uh, how do we approach an exam, any exam, not one particular exam. Uh, well, uh, if you look at uh, society there is uh, always a constant reinforcement of stereotypes uh, do you people understand what the stereotype is basic notion aha uh -huh. no Old school thinking type. Sorry? Old school thinking type. No, it's not that. Uh, a stereotype is a kind of a typical thought process which gets reinforced in society on a daily basis okay so that's that's called a stereotype actually yeah you have these for example uh, there is a stereotype that the whites are superior to the blacks so a stereotype is something that does not uh, have uh, what should we say uh, it, it, it does not have any kind of uh, base in reality it's not uh, it doesn't have any base in reality yet it is a thought process that is perpetuated over a long period of time. Now that is a problem that we face in our life every day with various different issues. We face, I am sure as girls, some of, some of you would agree that uh, Sometimes you face a negative stereotype and sometimes you face a positive stereotype. Uh, the positive stereotype is girls are more sincere than boys are when it comes to studies. That's a positive stereotype from the point of view of uh, girls. From the point of view of girls, a negative stereotype is that uh, girl students are not as motivated as boys because of the fact that uh, very few girls actually will take up a career and continue with it for the rest of their uh, working years. Most people will say, people to, you know, will take up a stereotype and, uh, I mean, sorry, not a stereotype. They'll complete a course and uh, 
by the time they are 23 or what, whatever it will be, by the time they finish their uh, um, post-graduation, as we call it here in India, um, and graduation, as it is called in the United States of America, um, people will be 23 and thereabouts. So they'll get married. And once they get married, they are going to pursue, um, they're going to pursue their, uh, what should I say? Uh, their uh, homemaker's life or whatever. So girl students are not seen as ambitious. Girl students are not seen as those who want to do uh, something with their lives, those who want to, those who are keen on uh, careers, all these things uh, are what we call stereotypes. Okay, and uh, the very unfortunate thing and I'm don't uh, sit and start thinking why am I or why is the great fat man talking about stereotypes now? We thought this was all about exams and anxieties that surround examinations. Uh, this is a part of that and uh, I'm afraid I will have to talk about stereotypes because even the exam thing is a part of a stereotype. Just a second, please. Sorry about that. Actually, I had a, just a, an hour before this meeting or an hour and a half before this meeting. I had a very severe attack of uh, rotary vertigo. Um, so I was a little disorientated. That happens when you have this rotary vertigo. Because what happens is your eyeballs uh, are the ones that go into a spin. That's why it looks like the world is spinning. It's called a rotary vertigo. And I suffer from that. And you know that. Uh, but strangely, today afternoon it happened. Uh, anyway, so to come back to this whole thing about stereotypes, a little bit of explanation about stereotypes is, is necessary. Uh, let me give you one example. When uh, Afghanistan was first liberated from the Taliban, when the American forces went into Afghanistan, all the people in America basically thought, especially the feminists, 
they basically thought once there was the removal of uh, this medieval thinking uh, group of people called the Taliban. The Taliban actually means scholars, by the way, but these people are illiterate and um, <clears throat> um, so they expected uh, women uh, to get rid of their veils, their chadars, their burqas, all these things. They thought the women will get rid of them and enjoy their freedom. The thing that actually happened was women continued to be in behind their veils, their, uh, what should I say, uh, their burkhas and chadars and hijabs. They were behind, uh, they were wearing all these things. But it was a men who were prohibited from shaving by the Taliban. Uh, you know, we think that Islam is only of one type. Uh, but the reality is there are different types of Islam. Uh, one of the most uh, orthodox forms of Islam that comes from Saudi Arabia uh, is the Wahhabi form of Islam. And uh, actually it is a very funny thing that we are seeing the growth of uh, Wahhabi Islam among Muslims of Hyderabad uh, because I remember very much uh, in my younger days and uh, thanks to my father I uh, I am acquainted with uh, the Urdu language, I can even use it. I can't uh, read and write, oh, uh, but I can speak it. I can speak it pretty fluently. Um, the general greeting that uh, a Muslim would the general greeting that a Muslim would use when uh, we had, when he ran into someone, Muslim or Hindu, either which way, uh, it used to be Adab. Some people just said Adab. Some people said Adab Arz hai. Now this Adab Arz hai, when it is said in a quick manner, it essentially uh, sounds like Adab Arz hai. Um, And uh, when taking leave of someone, uh, people said uh, Khuda Hafiz or uh, if it was the evening, people said Shabbe Khair. That was the Urdu that was used in Hyderabad. Now nobody uses these greetings. 
I rarely find anyone who uses adab. Adab is here, uh, which is I'm paying my respects to you. Adab, respects to you. Adab is here. That's what it means. It's a secular greeting. It's been replaced by a religious greeting, which is "Salam alaikum." And in return, you are supposed to say "Wa alaikum salam," which is invocation of God. as allah and uh, when you're taking leave of someone khuda hafiz khuda is a general notion of uh, a god could be any god but nowadays people only say allah hafiz they don't say khuda hafiz it's disappeared so there is a wahhabi form form of uh, islam that is being perpetuated in different parts of the world by the uh, saudi arabian uh, rulers so if you look at this now there's a new stereotype that muslims will either say salam alaikum or if they feel that you will not accept that then they will use good morning good evening and you know those kind of uh, western greetings they use those kind of western greetings so you see therefore uh, because of the growth of the wahhabi form in afghanistan also the men were prohibited from shaving and you will see that uh, is increasingly uh, happening in uh, in what should i say why is this person going on so as per the tenets of wahhabi islam you have to grow a beard and not a mustache you see people don't have a mustache but they have a beard and very funnily uh rock bands especially the heavy metal rock bands use this type of uh, what the americans we used to call them mustache and beard uh, the americans call it mustache and uh, facial hair they don't uh, refer to it as a beard so the americans don't have the rock stars don't have mustaches and they have face facial uh, 
hair ala wahabi muslims so that's become a heavy metal uh, and uh, grunge rock music uh, style of uh, uh what should i say of uh, wearing one's hair now so when the americans essentially said we have liberated afghanistan the women didn't do anything they continued to be behind their hijabs behind their veils and burkas uh, but the men went in on to the roads all shaven and shorn and feeling very thrilled with themselves so this baffled the americans especially the feminists they didn't think that it will be the men who would rejoice the intervention of america uh they thought it will be the uh women who will rejoice and uh, the women were quite happy being what they were now so they obviously the feminists found it very difficult to digest this so they wanted to investigate it further they went ahead and started investigating and when they were investigating they came to a point where uh, they were asking women why aren't you celebrating freedom and the answer that they got is who says we are not free we are free and uh, then the western researchers women researchers they said but look at you you are you don't have the freedom to express yourself the way you want through fashionable dressing and all those things and uh, the women said why should we and they said uh, we don't have rape in our society we don't have rape teasing in our society and uh, we are very comfortable we there is we, we don't compete for careers we don't need to compete for careers we take care of the house and our home and our husbands are the ones who earn for the family so this is a mindset that was simply not understood by the westerners and they had built all these stereotypes that these women are waiting to burst out onto the streets doing exactly what the american women do color their hair uh, no get their teeth shaped in a particular manner and that didn't happen what happened was the men did those things or the equivalents of those things now exams are very much caught in a stereotype unfortunately it's not a one way stereotype uh 
it is a two-way stereotype. When we talk about exams, what is a one-way stereotype and what is a two-way stereotype? A one-way stereotype is when only a student is worried about his exams. And uh, the teacher is the source of comforting and telling the students, you have nothing to worry. That is what the teacher is supposed to do. But the teachers don't do that. And there is a third prong to this, which is the family, which measures the success of their uh, children in terms of uh, the ranks that they get in school, the marks that they get, and uh, they want everybody to be, uh, what should I say? Uh, they want all their children to get 99 out of 100. It was like that. Now I think they'll, they are demanding a 1000 out of 100 or something like that. So the marks are the end all and be all of education. None of the parents want to know if uh, the children actually know anything or are they just being given marks for nothing? Okay. Uh, there's a, an old uh, Dire Straits song, which is called Money for Nothing. Uh, here we are getting marks for nothing. In our days, we, we even had a board exam uh, for seventh class. And uh, when I wrote my seventh class examination, the total pass percentage of uh, people in the undivided Andhra Pradesh was 8%. And I got a first class. But when I say I got a first class, I didn't get a truckload of marks. I just about got 61% or something like that. And the second boards that I took, the SSC, the state highest at that time, uh, was 441 out of a possible 600. Uh, now I think it is 600 out of 600. And the slowly kept creeping up, even in the intermediate, if you got anywhere near 68% or 70%, you were considered to be a good student. 
and more importantly they were there were no textbooks written for students if he had to understand different subjects we had to go search out different books that dealt with these different parts of the subjects and read from different books the teachers would give us some indication of what books to read and uh, we would go in search of them and while we were search we were searching for those books if we found a similar book by another author we would borrow it go back show to the teacher and uh, we would uh, ask for validation of that book can we follow this book is what uh, is what that is written in this book reliable and uh, we were either told yes or no depending on the book so for us textbooks ended with the 10th class after that we didn't have textbooks when i was when we were doing a, what we call undergraduate doing a ba they were not textbooks we were uh, asked to read a different uh, historians for history we were asked to read uh, rc majumdar we were asked to read uh, sumit sarkar we were asked to read uh, satish chandra not me i was named after him by the way that's what my father told me he read about him in the newspaper like the name so he decided to give me that name uh, satish chandra is a very famous historian especially of a uh, medieval uh, india i found it very funny when some students found that book of mine and called up and said sir we found your book and i said which one and they said the history of medieval india i said please see when is the first edition i wasn't even born then so anyway uh, so we were asked to read from and bipin chandra and for ancient india romela thapar uh, r s sharma hmm? r s sharma r s sharma came a little later yes but definitely r s sharma's uh, history is uh, leftist as is uh, dd kosambis and dd kosambis is not a historian dd kosambi is uh, not a historian by qualification but he is otherwise a pretty decent leftist uh a historian and later on we when we had to do 
political science, initially we were asked to read uh, A.C. Kapoor, Anup Chand Kapoor. And uh, we were also asked to read another author uh, whose name I forgot. But who is Eddie it? Ashirwada. No, no, not Ashirvatam. Appadurai. Arjun Appadurai. Uh, the Substance of Politics. That was a book. Uh, uh, we were asked to read Arjun Appadurai. And uh, when we had to read the Constitution of India, then we had to read M. V. Paili and uh, Durgadas Basu, D. D. Basu, as he was called. Uh, and for uh, political process, we were asked to read a number of books starting with the pre-independence era, Rajni Pal Medat, and uh, then we were asked to read uh, some of the historians who described the political processes. So we also read uh, Bipin Chandra, for uh, understanding the colonial state. Bipin Chandra writes about the colonial state. Um, and we were asked to read that. So we read that. And uh, we also read uh, Granville Austin. Uh, what is that book called? Uh, Indian Constitution, a cornerstone, something. And uh, a book by Casey Weir, W H E A R E, where he calls the Indian political system quasi federal or semi federal. So we read these different authors. We were asked to read Paul R. Brass, uh, which we did. And uh, once we went to post-graduation, it was the normal thing for the teacher while teaching a topic to just give out some four or five names of the books that we were supposed to read. And we had to read them. And uh, the person who taught us Indian political process, and uh, since I didn't study public administration uh, at uh, the level of my BA. In my MA, I opted for two papers in public administration taught by two wonderful gentlemen, uh, Professor uh, S.N. Cha and uh, Professor Kuldeep Mathur because I realized that I had to know what uh, public administration is. Uh, it is only here in uh, Telangana and to a very limited extent, very, very limited extent in Andhra Pradesh 
and perhaps one or two universities in Rajasthan. Uh, it's only here that public administration is uh, treated as a separate subject. Otherwise, everywhere else, public administration is a part of political science. Uh, and since we were not taught, uh, if we had to learn public administration, we had to take it as a separate subject. Uh, but there uh, we had the option of studying it. So, and these were amazing scholars about Chester Bernard, about uh, Seymour Lipset, about uh, F.W. Taylor, Elton Mayo. So I studied under them and they would prescribe a number of books. And uh, I never had a problem with the exams. God has kind of blessed me with a lot of problems in life. A lot of problems in life. But uh, one and, and one of my problems in life is I feel anxious about various things. I have illness phobia and uh, that is one of my anxieties. If anyone falls ill, I feel tremendously uh, anxious. So, One of the things that he gave me, a positive blessing, was a lack of fear of the exams. I've never feared exams. My mother was my first teacher. Literally, she was my first teacher. She began my education process at home when I was about two years old, or probably even less. And uh, though she was a teacher, and also worked in the Nizamabad Women's College for some time. As I grew up a little, she decided that uh, she will stay back at home and take care of my education. So every evening, seven o'clock, was the time that my education would start with my mother. And it was, it always started with maths. And it lasted something like one to one and a half hours. And uh, then I was allowed to have about one hour or again, yeah, about one hour for other subjects. My mom believed. When I say maths, it, uh, you can also include uh, physics in it. And I told you, if you remember, I know I'm sounding like Jeffrey Boycott, uh, whose commentary I used to love because he used to say, in our days, we didn't have uh, these machines that were bowling 
very fast at us and uh, we had to improvise and devise ways of in improving our technique. I'm not sounding like that, but I'm sounding like him saying in our days. And I used to wonder why do people talk about in our days and I guess uh, that's a natural process of aging. That's what I believe today. Anyway, so I uh, was meant to study maths first and foremost. That was the most important subject in my life. Uh, and uh, then I studied other things. But the rule was the rule was that I would study what was taught in the class. Okay. I would study what was taught in the class on a particular day. I had to study that on that day itself. I had to start studying that. I don't know how it is now, how the schools are, because I don't have uh, children of my own. And uh, so I don't get to see what people do. But uh, when we went to school, we were supposed to do, we had two sets of books, not textbooks, notebooks. One which is called the classwork notebook and the other which is called the homework notebook. So while in class, we had to open up, open our classwork notebook, make a note of what was being taught. And our teachers would tell us, note this point. This is very important. This is extremely important for you. Not from the point of view of an, an examination, but from the point of view of gaining knowledge. That's what we would be told. Note this down. And I still remember my physics teacher. A combination of genius and uh, uncouth behavior towards students. I resented him for that. One of the few people that I actually resented. Um, and it was him who made me a uh, a devotee of the Pink Floyd song called Another Brick in the Wall. Has anyone heard that song? Another Brick in the Wall, part two. Well, I'll recite it for you. It goes, when we grew up and went to school, there were certain teachers who would hurt the children any way they could by pouring their derision upon anything we did, exposing every weakness, however carefully 
hidden by the kid and then it goes on to we don't need no education we don't need no thought control no dark sarcasm in the classroom teacher leave us kids alone it was an anthem i still play it to remind myself that i shouldn't become the draconian teacher and uh, this particular uh, it's called a double album in the sense that it has four sides uh instead of the usual two uh, and this particular double album was made into a movie called the wall if you like you can you can kind of uh, what should i say uh you can look at uh, the youtube channel and search out the movie if not the movie at least the clipping of this song another brick in the wall part 2 so the thing is that uh, i went to school at a time when we had good teachers told us what were the important things made sure that we noted those points down in um uh, made sure that uh, we noted the points down in our class workbook and then they would give us homework which is based on that day's class but it wouldn't obviously cover the entire class and teachers were also mindful of the fact that we had to study not just their subject but other people's other subjects as well so they would give us reasonable amount of homework oh, jesus christ so and then we used to sit and study the other things and uh, for our english we were encouraged to read uh, classics like david copperfield uh novels by thomas hardy in our school itself okay uh far from the madding crowd and the return of the native we were asked to read uh, other writers apart from charles dickens and thomas hardy we were also asked to read jane austen pride and uh, prejudice they're not a part of the curriculum we were made to study these things every day and then we had a teacher miss nancy uh who at one point was a class teacher and when she was a class teacher the first 20 minutes of our class was simply devoted to asking us what we read in the newspaper 
on a given day. She made it very, very clear to us that we had to read the newspaper every day. And so what some people used to do is they used to write down the headlines and come. She used to catch hold of them and say, so what was written under that headline? And these people couldn't answer that. But she did this. She inculcated the newspaper reading habit. And every Saturday, we would have a current affairs quiz every Saturday in her class. We would have current affairs quiz which she herself conducted. And uh, we would have every fourth Saturday, we would have a general knowledge quiz. Like she would ask us, what were the original, what was the original name given to X-rays? she would ask us questions about abbreviations. She would say, expand UNESCO. Many different kinds of things. Now we're grown up, so they sound easy. But when you're in school, you're still a child. These are not easy. She used to talk about NATO. So, Every day was a day of education for us. It is in fact for this particular reason. It is in fact for this particular reason when I set up the AVR Institute, I didn't want to call it a coaching institute. I wanted to provide education. And my idea is that if you study, if you do your job, if you do your studies, then you have nothing to fear nothing to feel anxious about. I never went around finding out what was the pattern of questions in the last two years. Let's check the old question papers. I didn't ever do that because a lot of people did this despite being discouraged from doing so by our teachers. They used to go around looking for old question papers. And my mother's very big contribution to life, to my life, was telling me that if you know the whole subject, this is of course in school, if you know the whole subject, if you know whatever is there to be studied in uh, the book, and if you stop thinking that you have a choice between questions to write an answer, you have to think of it as you have no choice. You'll be given questions which are compulsory and you have to write them. And they'll come, they'll basically 
have the entire syllabus covered in the question paper. So you have to be ready for that. And for that, classwork plus homework and a little bit of studying beyond both those would take care of things. The point that I'm trying to make here is I don't see you people. The only person I see is my hippopotamus self and uh, I really don't know if you're taking any notes in class. I put all those things on the board, on this whiteboard, so that you take them down as points. Why should you do that? Because if you do that, then you have a ready reckoner of what has been taught to you in class. You know what has been taught to you. You just have to open your notebook and see the points that you have taken down. And uh, it also becomes, it also becomes easy for you when you have to read from more than one book. Because you can't read the full book. Like, for example, when I talked about history, I talked about so many writers. I talked about Majumdar, I talked about Sumit Sarkar, I talked about Pipin Chandra. Is it possible to read all their books completely? You can't. But your teacher is one who has researched on all these things. That is the importance of research. Unfortunately, you don't have those teachers these days. Teachers don't research anymore. They have bogus research degrees. My daily dose of humor comes from looking at the posts that the teachers make on the MA semester one thread and MA semester four thread. I love to get up in the morning and look at the posts that are made by teachers, my fellow, my colleagues. And some of them have been peals and splits of laughter. They're so stupidly written. The lady who fancies herself to be an English pundit also writes something like join above link. What does that even mean? Join above link. It, it, can't you say use the link above to join the class? You First of all, the person in question cannot put that link. It has been put by someone and that is why it comes as forwarded. That's bad enough. And over and above that, you have join above link. So, 
There used to be a serial on Doordarshan called Kaha Gaye Wo Log, which is about the patriots of the country. At a time when the country was in the 80s, when it was going through a sort of a problem with Khalistan on one side, Kashmir on the same side, and the Northeast. So those were not uh, very good times for India. And uh, so they made uh, serials on Doordarshan. I still think some of the best serials I've seen in my life are on Doordarshan. I remember Buniyad, which is set in the partition of the country. A superb serial. Then the story of a lower middle class family, which is called Hamlog which had an introduction or call it every episode had a prologue and an epilogue uh, by the great actor Ashok Kumar and uh, then we had this uh, other uh, serial which is called Nukkad. Nukkad is a street corner kind of a thing. It was about life of different people living in one colony. So Nukkad was another amazing serial with great content content in it and there was this Bharat Ek Khoj based in Nehru's discovery of India based in that uh, and made by Sham Benegal and that is there on YouTube. See it if you can. Amazing serial. And uh, there was even a serial by Sham Benegal on Indian railways and a train journey. It was called suffer suffer as in the Hindi word suffer which is a journey and there was another one called Upanyas and we were exposed to films made on novels by Tolstoy novels made uh, sorry films made on novels by Fyodor Dostoevsky it was one channel but it showed a lot more of meaningful content content sorry uh, compared to all the channels that you have put together which are complete nonsense, mindless, useless. And unfortunately, even newspapers, news channels, I don't even want to talk about them. They're crap. You shouldn't watch them. But even newspapers are becoming increasingly unreliable. But still, 
in the given set of newspapers it is the hindu that is still the best though it is not even a pale shadow of what it once was if you had to read the hindu you needed 6 hours if you had to read it fully from front to back it probably needed 6 hours people used to call it the daily magazine not the daily newspaper it's not like that anymore and but all said and done it is still one of the better newspapers i don't know that girl sharwani puts these newspapers every day on the avr institute thread for people to read i don't know how many read it first and foremost you have to start reading newspapers if you want to do well in exams especially as students of political science but i'll come to that later let me talk about the asymmetry the asymmetry between the teacher and the taught ideally a teacher should consider himself a student because you can't be a teacher if you're not a student this i learned in life when uh, i was in the hostel people would come to me and say abe satish ye samajh mein nahi aa raha yaar padha de thoda kya hai ye thoda explain kar dena and uh, suddenly i found that every day for about half an hour to 45 minutes somebody or the other would come to my room and ask me to help them with something and that is when i realized that people were coming to me because i studied on a daily basis i took down notes please remember you have to take down notes you really have to take down notes and you have to read not from one book but from different books why because you get contending perspectives and if you have a very good teacher like i had say in political theory professor sudipto kaviraj who was a marxist but i never seen the marxist side of him when he taught john locke he taught john locke on the merit of john locke when he taught adam smith he taught adam smith on the merit of smith never let his marxism come in the way and uh, so he became a role model for me and that is what i call the reference group in socialization he was definitely my reference group as was gurpreet mahajan and uh, i had a tendency to experiment i used to go there was a bookshop called geeta bookshop on the campus i used to go and pick up a book occasionally 
but I used to go almost every second day to see what books were coming. I didn't have too much money. I was sent with a draft for 2000 rupees for the entire semester. For the entire semester. And that I had to take care of my mess bill. Well, it was a big thing that uh, it was dirt cheap to travel in Delhi. A monthly bus pass was 11 rupees. And Delhi had this uh, unique system. Whether you were traveling for one stage or you were going to travel for 10 stages in a city bus, your, the ticket was 30 paisa. So, later on they changed, of course. But we had these good teachers whom we could approach and ask if I was having a problem with something, I would ask, I'm having a problem with this and they would uh, No, ma'am, I did not write UPSC. But that does not mean that I'm ineligible to talk about UPSC. I didn't write UPSC simply because I was not interested in it. Simply because I was not interested in it. I have been associated with UPSC in other ways and I can't discuss those which are confidential, but as a teacher, I've been associated with UPSC. So if you're wondering if I know anything about UPSC, yes, I do. I do the inside out of UPSC. I know the inside out of UPSC. Towards the end, I'll talk about that. So the, the thing therefore is that you have to know as much as you can. And Gurpreet found that I had this habit of reading different kinds of books. And uh, she would see that when I wrote term papers or when I wrote answers, she would see that I wrote things that she didn't teach. And she hadn't heard of some of the people that I wrote about, W.V.O. Quinn being another one. I will clear this doubt, madam. Uh, Today, just let me do this session. I would like to... Political science is the study of Indian, uh, of polity, if you like. <clears throat> it is the study of polity. And uh, it is something which is absolutely intrinsic to the understanding of the idea of the polity itself. You can ask these other people that you're seeing there, ask them how long it took me to tell them how the word polity came into being, starting with Plato and with Aristotle 
I don't know. Those lectures are on YouTube. Uh, I can't remember which dates they were on. But uh, you will find those lectures. I'll tell you about them later. Uh, on politia. That is the word from which polity came. Politia, the Greek word. Eudaimonia. eudaimonia. Uh, politia and eudaimonia. And uh, Plato's Republic was uh, originally called Politia, but Aristotle's Politia got translated into polity. And that's how uh, politics also came in. If you like, you can attend tomorrow morning's MA class where I will be discussing polit politics in the modern period. And uh, if you're interested, let me know. The class is from 9 to 10.40. And uh, I'll put a link. I'll basically put a link. Uh, if you're interested on the AVR group so that you can join that class. Technically, I shouldn't do it, but I don't see how anyone will. Yeah, okay. So I'll uh, put that on the AVR group. Uh, and join the class. Join the class and you'll understand because uh, tomorrow we'll, Akshay has actually asked me a question about Savonarola. I have to explain that and then I'll go on to the social contractualists. But uh, if, you, if I find you in class, uh, I will, uh, <clears throat> if for whatever reasons I miss you, just put a message saying I'm in class and I'll quickly do a small recce with you uh, on uh, Machiavelli. Aristotle is called the father of politics and Aristotle, Machiavelli is called the founder of politics. There are a few things which are which have to be taught in detail. For that, you have to refer to my lectures, which are on YouTube. And I'll tell you which other ones I'll check and tell you those. Check those lectures, you'll get them. But join the class tomorrow if you don't have anything better. Uh, so, Please take down notes that you will know. You have a reference point in terms of what to study in a book that you might find. Don't sit and just listen and go away. While you're listening, it seems like you're, yeah, I am internalizing this whole thing. But on a daily basis, when you're internalizing, so many different things, uh, then you have a problem. The problem that you have is that you forget what is what. So to have some kind of a, this thing, put a date on your, if you're attending a class today, put five, seven, whatever, and uh, discuss, just write what, write down the important points. And in the end, write a two line summary of what was discussed in the class. No, not just for my subject. If there's anyone teaching you anything meaningful, please do that.
Well, with international relations, you only have to read Vinay Kumar Malhotra, I guess. So for that, you don't really need to take down notes. Um, for Indian political process, God bless you. At some point, <clears throat> when I finish political ideologies with you, I think I should do Indian politics with you. It's very important every which way, even if you're going to write for, I know Akshay wants to write UPSC and there is general studies paper two, which is Indian polity and Indian uh, general studies paper four, which is international relations uh, and what you are studying is not going to cover either of the two papers. What you are studying in class. Hmm? So, anyway, so if you know the whole, the, the coming back to the point about examination, know as much as you can. then you don't have to worry about, will I be able to write the answer? Because all said and done, all said and done, the syllabus is finite. It's not infinite. It can't go into unanticipated areas. It doesn't. And I give you so much general information because I know quite a few of you have UPSC in your uh, crosshairs, so to speak. And there is no way to train for the UPSC prelims, which are multiple choice questions, which is a very unfortunate way of testing people. It is a way to weed out. It is a system like, you know, a knockout system in a sport. A knockout system in a sport where uh, you basically are holding some kind of a match to throw to throw one of the two teams out. Well, here uh, you're holding a test in order to throw many people out. It is very easy to test people for what they don't know. It is extremely difficult to test people through MCQs or for that matter, even essay answers it is extremely difficult to test people for what they know. It's very easy for Okay. How to read a text? You don't begin with the text. You begin with the lecture. Because the lecture sets the tenor for, uh, it sets the tenor for your, uh, what should I say? Uh, it sets the tenor for your, uh, The, for the whoever it is that you're studying, since you said political thought, uh, let's say if you're doing Hobbes, uh, when we do Hobbes, I'll be talking about uh, Leo Strauss, I'll be talking about Michael Oakeshott, I'll be talking about uh, C.B. Macpherson, 
I may talk about uh, um, David Gauthier and uh, if I'm doing Hegel, I might talk about, I will talk about, not I might, I will talk about, uh, uh, what should I say? I will talk about uh, Charles Taylor. I'll talk about Raymond Plant. I'll talk about uh, I'll, uh, I'll talk about uh, Fred Dolmayer. I'll probably even talk about Shlomo Aveneri. Now, you can't read all these books. I didn't read all these books when I was a student. When I was doing my MA. When I became a researcher, that is when I started reading these books in their entirety. And once I became a teacher, I started reading the original texts. I started reading the original texts. So, no, you don't read a book first. You listen to the lecture first. Take the points down. Ask for the title of which book to read. There are some, uh, OP Gauba is okay. Uh, OP Gauba is op okay to, for your uh, MA but it's not okay for any other exams, UGC, JRF, no, he's not adequate. Uh, Kirti, are you still there? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. So, Kirti, you don't have to worry about uh, completion of the syllabus. It'll be done. What you need to worry about is how much you learned. And that is dependent on how regular you are to classes. And like I said, taking down notes and making them a reference to search for in books. I'll search and give you the names of books, some of which may be uh, available online in Google Books, which means you can't download it, you can't copy it, but you can read. So what you need to do is you need to go into Google Books and you need to type the keywords, the keywords will be those which you have noted down from the lecture. Those will be the keywords. And once you've noted those down from the lecture and you type those in, that section of the book is thrown up on the Google book search. That section is thrown up. So you can read that. So it'll just give you what you've typed just that much. Uh, Madam Padma, that is an answer for you also. Yes, sir. Yeah. So use the key phrases. It'll show number of textbooks and it'll show these or number of books, not textbooks. Textbooks are expressive written for uh, the sake of uh, what do we say for the sake of the curriculum but not all books are textbooks so and you can also do an author kind of a search with the keywords 
like for example you can say expressivism charles taylor it'll show up in rousseau it'll show up hegel but if you don't want rousseau you want only hegel then you type that as expressivism charles taylor hegel and it'll throw that bit up you have to learn how to use the internet for searching these things out and uh, it's just a matter of a few days three or four days and you'll get it for your indian uh, politics if you're having the political system you have to read to uh, read uh, this book by uh, dd basu which is uh, available in a market those of you who can afford it buy it it's called introduction to the indian constitution there is also a book by mv pailey there are two books actually one which is a very very thin book uh i forget the name of that book the other one is called uh, the indian constitution uh i've forgotten the names of books by pailey what you can do is you can do a google search on mv pailey's books on indian constitution m space v space p y l e e pailey was a jurist himself so he is a very very well informed author so you'll get good reading material there for indian political system for uh, you can also read uh, that omnibus kind of a textbook which is called uh, what is it called uh it's called indian government and politics i think yes by bidyut b i d y u t bidyut chakravarti and there's another author whose name i'm not able to recollect but if you type this you'll get it it will cover both your semesters and that's good enough for upsc for today i'll end the session by talking i'm getting my what you go back uh we'll do this again in the weekend if necessary uh books and how to read them answers and how to write them um uh, actually uh madam padma i have read that article you sent me but i just haven't been in a position to give you feedback uh i'll do it as soon as possible i'm caught up in a couple of things yes, apart no ap- apart from bad health okay apart from bad health i'm caught up in a few problems uh so problems that are consuming my time i i guess i have got unnecessarily into some anyway let's see time will tell whether it was necessary or unnecessary uh but i'll i'll also tell you how to do a writing of an answer one of these days i think 
we can have one day per week for these kind of things. Uh, so you can read Vidya Chakrabarti, but for international relations, I need to check. I need to check the books. I have forgotten the names of the authors, but I really do need to check the names of the authors. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, now those of you who plan to write the UPSC, please remember one thing that it is uh, now a lottery. One person who may or may not be well educated sets a question paper. But given the fact that these are in lacks, uh, what happens is that the testing is done negatively. Most of the questions that people will ask you are about articles of the Indian Constitution. Which article of the Indian Constitution says what? You know, those kind of technical questions which are not necessary for a political science student to know. That is what happens at the level of the prelims, which is where the most number of people get, most number of people get eliminated. Okay, and that is done in a very, very negative fashion. It's done in a very negative fashion. I don't have an answer as to how you can combat that. But you, if you're looking at uh, the mains examination, that has also become another lottery. It has become a lottery because of the fact that the person who sets the question papers might be an intelligent person, might actually ask you good questions for which you might write pretty good replies, but there's the people who are correcting the scripts are people from Usmania University, Ujjain University, uh, and uh, Ujjain Vikram University, Kurukshetra University, that is because it's closest to Delhi, that is where the maximum number of examiners go then the Chaudhary Charan Singh University in Meerut, which is also just about an hour. It's now almost a part of Delhi. Uh, so they call them from there because everybody is cutting costs. And uh, as a result of that, it's become a lottery. The person who sets the question paper is supposed to give a model answer they're also supposed to give uh, the thing of what are the points that must be there in the answer written by the candidate and what are the points that shouldn't be there in that answer. Uh, but hardly anyone follows this because nobody has the time to keep referring to that sheet which is given as a result of which a number of people just correct as they please. So pinning your hopes, don't put all your hopes into that one basket called UPSC. Cracking the UPSC doesn't uh, mean that you're doing extremely well not cracking the UPSC doesn't mean 
that you're not doing well. Okay? It's just a lottery. A lot of good people get eliminated. A lot of useless people get selected. That's how it is. So my advice to anybody who's taking the UPSC is please consider other careers. This is the day and age when you can have careers that we didn't imagine in our time. People have now opportunities for making uh, a career out of things that we didn't know existed when we were students. We had about three or two kinds of opportunities. And especially if you did a BA, then you were considered to be the arts type, which means you were doing a BA because you couldn't do anything else. That's how it was. But that's not how it is today. So there are alternative careers. If you like, my wife is a career counselor. I'll get her to speak to you one day about the different kinds of careers that one can choose. Uh, but I pr consider myself to be a pretty decent career counselor. I can also help you with that. Uh, but please don't put all your, don't pin all your hopes on UPSC because it's not in your hands. It's as simple as that. You may have written the best script from among all the scripts that are there, but you may not get chosen. That is if you have made to the made it to the mains. But the biggest problem is the prelims, which is where you'll be tested for absolute trash, the livestock population of the country, of which how many are buffalo and how many are cows? How much of sheep rearing is going on? So all these kinds of nonsensical questions. So what you should do for that is, uh, I don't know if such a book is available now. There was, there used to be a book called The Unique uh, Quintessence of UPSC exam, which was a large fat compilation of questions from previous examinations. And that would give you a pretty decent idea about, uh, about how or what kind of questions you can anticipate in the prelims. You can't have a coaching for prelims if somebody is telling you that they'll coach you for the prelims. What they are doing is getting these books and telling you about them instead of paying them lakhs and being told something from a book that costs a few hundreds. A better thing to do is be to go to Koti. You have those Rajkamal bookstores and all those bookstores out there uh, where you'll find books on UPSC for prelims specifically. Those are the books that you sit, just have to sit and look at, mug up if you can. And that's what it is. The other exams, be prepared to write the whole syllabus. Understand the syllabus, understand everything or most of the thing that is there to be understood in the syllabus. Make notes in your classes and study accordingly. 
from books. Start off with Indian books. Apart from O.P. Kauba, there was another writer who had uh, written a book called Western Political Philosophy, Sukhbir Singh, that's his name. It's a two volume book. You can read from that if you like. Those are good enough if you don't have scholarly ambitions. But even to, because that's two volumes, you can't read two volumes. So even to be able to read those kind of books, you still need to take lecture notes. And please believe me, lecture notes do 90% of your work. Don't let your mind wander. You know, this is a situation where you're all in, in a burqa. It's a situation where your mind can wander very easily. And there's no way I can tell you that you're wandering, your, your thoughts are wandering. If there's a physical audience in front of me, it's a good thing because I can tell people, listen, you're not listening to me. I can say that. But in this kind of a scenario, I don't know if you're there or not. Some people just, I know this for a fact, some people just put that on and go off and do the other jobs. Uh, but this is proving to be good for me. It's building my reputation on the internet because I upload all the classes. So there are a lot of people who are visiting my classes. The analytics of YouTube show that. So it's good for me, but I don't know how good it is for you. So there is no magic bullet. There is no need for any magic bullet. Just remember, there is no made easy solution for any exam. For any exam, there is no made easy solution. As far as UPSC is concerned, pray to God that the dice roll in your favor in the prelims and that somebody intelligent will correct your papers if you make it to the mains. That's what you need to do. So that's it for today. Tomorrow we resume with multiculturalism. Any questions? Still any more doubts, anxieties? See, actually, uh... <laughs> yeah, right. Right, 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 ma'am. Okay. All right. That makes sense. That that makes sense. It's also good for me. Actually, my doctors have been telling me to go easy. So, yeah, that's fine. Sir. Yeah. We are not, not knowing who are uh, typing this uh, text. What are you replaying or whom you are replaying? We are uh, a bit confusing. 
Uh, that's okay because, uh, well, there's this lady whose name is flashing. B. Vishnu Priya. That's how I added her. Her name is Vishnu Priya. Bandhavi or Bandhavi? I don't know. Bandhavi, sir. Bandhavi. Yeah. Vishnu Priya Bandhavi has joined us from today. Uh, she wanted to know some things about UPSC, how to prepare for them. It was in response to her that I started talking about UPSC. The other ones were by uh, Madam Padma, uh, who has a problem. She doesn't want these long classes in the evenings. Sir, is she PGR degree? I don't know anything about Vishnu Priya. What what is your, what are you doing, Vishnu Priya? Degree, sir. So just now completed my second year and entering into degree, sir. You're entering degree. Yes, sir. Ah, oh, you're trying to board the bus very early. Okay. 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 All right. So do you want me to put that thing tomorrow? Because in your first year, uh, you have uh, political thought now. So do you want me to put that link for your sake, Vishnu Priya? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. I'll do that. So... Uh, Padma has a problem, Akshay. What is it, sir? She's a very tolerant person, but uh, she finds it difficult to tolerate me. So I'm stretching her resources and her this thing with my long, long lectures, which she wants me to keep short. Okay. So we'll keep them short in the evening, not in the morning. Uh, in the morning, I have to take that time, otherwise I'll be pulled up. Sir, I have a doubt. What is meant by Marxist historians? Uh, Marx had a certain idea of uh, what history is. He interpreted, see, history is all about interpretation. He interpreted history from the point of view of what he called objective material conditions. He interpreted history that way. And uh, he basically uh, uses economic uh, values and labor as being basically constitutive of the cores of human history. So those who use the Marxist methodology in order to interpret history, they are uh, called Marxist historians. Then you have the entire subaltern group under uh, Ranojit Guha and to a certain extent, uh, even Bhikkhu Parikh. Uh, these are people who interpret uh, history from the point of view of what they call the subalterns. The subalterns are the people that you don't see, but who have contributed it was a very good idea when it started, but uh, it has been reduced to such banalities that uh, now nobody talks about subaltern histories anymore because they have become simply banal. The inane, there is no meaning to that. Everybody writes a history of himself like one Kancha Elaya from my department, 
uh, who wrote a book called Why I Am Not a Hindu. And uh, for all those people who like one-line answers, he could have written that in one line. He wrote a whole book, which is also not, again, very fat. Uh, he should have simply written, I am not a Hindu because I don't know anything about what is Hinduism. That should have been his... Uh, but uh, he was egged on by the, the people have agendas, even in academics. He was, uh, he was egged on by the likes of Suzy Taru, I think. And uh, they exalted him to the status of uh, Bertrand Russell, who wrote a book titled Why I'm Not a Christian. And uh, Ailaya had to face an ignominy when he went into class and found uh, something written on the board. What was written on the board is, it said, uh, sir, please write a book called Why I Am Not a Teacher. Hmm? Why is it, sir? Because it's Why did the... Why did it happen? Because he teaches rubbish. Somebody wrote an article about him, about how Ailea's research is. It's, he wrote it in the form of a story. And uh, it is Ailea gets off a bus and is walking into a village. The first thing he sees is that there is a street dog chasing, uh, uh, what should I say? Uh, a street dog uh, chasing a cockerel or a rooster. And therefore that bird flies and he walks a little more inside and somebody feeds grain to pigeons and uh, the pigeons are eating from the ground. So Ailea immediately concludes that a pigeon is a bird that cannot fly it is something that is on the ground. And uh, a hen or a rooster is something that flies and lives up in trees. That is how his research is. He'll talk to one person. He once sat in a plane next to an Englishman who told him something. And so he came and taught in class about what that one man said about something. That can't be the basis for teaching, can it? A conversation, a casual conversation on an aircraft, is not the basis for teaching. So that's why. Sir, his uh, books are published by Sage Publications. <laughs> Famous uh, publishers did publish those books. Which books? Why will they, why will those publishers? Which, uh, which books? Why I'm not Hindu, post Hindu, India. That is, that is not published by Sage. That's not published by Sage. That's published by some publisher here in Hyderabad. This new book, uh, his autobiography. You are, write a book, I'll get it published by Sage. <laughs> no, I'm serious. 
publishing is no big deal there is an arrangement which is made which is called a buyback a publisher will publish your book if you say that you'll buy back a certain number of copies uh which will take care of the printing of a certain number of books okay uh so if they are going to print 1000 books and uh, it's going to cost a certain amount of money then you'll sell buy back a few books which is basically saying say, look i'm giving you the money please print the books but to make it look like a legal deal to make it look make it legal not look like to make it legal publishers will say okay i'll give you a certain number of copies in return so that's how it works publishing is a racket like everything else it's an absolute racket the no. only only books that are published without uh, collecting money from authors usually are textbooks because the sale of those books are uh, the sale of those books are uh, what should i say um, guaranteed people will buy textbooks okay so i had to my edited book which is finally likely to see the light of day they sent me a huge questionnaire and said who are your targets and they also asked me how i am going to help in marketing the book so my initial urge was to say why should i market the book you are the people who are supposed to market it but they said you know this is a time of pandemic and all that so you have to help us market the book so i said how do i do it and they said you tell us so i said okay i'll tell people in different universities that this is a good book it's it's not a book written by me it's just edited by me with uh, an article in that by me and uh, uh, there are several other articles on gender politics of identity politics of development and so i said this can be marketed to students because these are all things that are studied but my other books that i have written i don't know what is going to be their fate i have to submit them and uh, i'll have to see if anyone will publish them because those are not books that lend themselves one book that i wrote uh that that was uh, during a good uh, time in the economy and has been selling well because i've been getting royalties as well so that book is okay but uh, but that was about indian politics sir how much they will pay for uh, writing the book but it depends i don't know i have never paid i don't get into those deals uh it it all depends sometimes a pay payment is underhand sometimes it is like i said learn, done legally all those things so that's how it is now let me tell you the deal that i entered with into my publisher i said to give me a certain number of books and uh, i'll uh, make sure that they find buyers and uh, i will not demand royalties 
for these number of books that you have given to me. That's a legal agreement that I will not demand a royalty. So they said, okay, do that. So what I intend to do is if I get those free copies, I'll, I mean, those copies, I'll distribute them free because I, I don't care if I don't get a royalty. I'll distribute them free to people who want them, who will benefit by reading them. That's what I'll do. But I'm foregoing my earning. Yes, but, sir. but that's okay. You, you shouldn't look at everything as a money-making exercise. You shouldn't. But the books that I have now, those are the ones that I don't know. What will be their fate? Will they get accepted or not? I don't think they'll be accepted because they are not things that are mainstream. They are proper research books. So let's see how that works out. You a Kancha Elea fan? No, sir. Um, I, I, I have this book, sir. That book, where I am not a Hindu. Mm. In that he says, Hinduism is violence because look at all the gods, they are holding weapons. Hinduism. He uses caste to differentiate between uh, Brahmins and uh, this lower caste. See, yeah, he's caught in a caste warp. Good for him. Good for him. If you want, if you think everything is ultimately down to caste, good for you. It's a free country. It's a democracy. Freedom of expression of ideas is a part of the freedom of speech. Good for him. If people believe him, even better. It doesn't matter that I think it's junk. It really doesn't matter that I think it's yes, junk. Sir. Yeah. Th that is the beauty of a democracy. <laughs> no, no. I don't mean it sarcastically. I don't mean it sarcastically. I actually mean it genuinely. I mean it genuinely. My only concern about him is, is that in the name of overcoming caste, he's deepening caste divides. Yes, sir. That is my problem with him. Yes, sir. I don't have any other problem with him. I'm very good friends with him. And this part of my, this thing, I tell him that you're deepening the caste divides. I, I actually tell him that. So, and he'll listen. He's not one of those people who won't listen to criticism. He'll listen to criticism. There are many positive traits that Kancha Ilaya has and which I personally appreciate. And I've been a recipient of favors. You know, when I first joined uh, Usman University in Nizam College and uh, he was the head of the department there and he said which paper would you like to teach I said I'd like to teach political thought he was teaching that paper he could jolly well have said I will not give this up he had the large heartedness of looking at a very young fellow just about 25 not even 25 who comes and cockily says, I'll teach political thought. He had the generosity to give that paper to me. And I'm always thankful to him 
for that because later on I faced a lot of problems in the allotment of papers. But with ILAYA, no. And I wanted to change the syllabus. That was the year when Nizam College became autonomous. He gave his full support for changing the syllabus. He's a progressive person that way. He's very democratic, very progressive, and a very bad scholar. But that doesn't detract here the fact that he's progressive, that he'll hear criticism about himself. I don't know too many people who will listen to criticism about them. Alaya is the only one I know. Anyway, enough of that. So thank you very much. You trim with this, uh, this part of the video. Sorry? You trim, you cut this, this part of the video, sir. No, no, that's okay. Why? I haven't said anything. Let's see. Okay. Yes, Miss uh, Padma, from tomorrow onwards, one hour. Right on. Thank you. Yes, thank you. All right. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah, right. Thank on. you, sir. Yeah. Bye, sir. Good night. Bye. Good night.